What up, gang? This Ken Zerk, Ken Zillion, Zika Milligan, the villain full of Trilligan. We are back on Umineko no Naku Koro Ni. Last episode, what's her name? Mar Mario was tweaking. And she was tweaking so hard that her mom came through and started beating the shit out of her. And then it cut to Kenzo, and Kenzo was talking about some damn sacrificing us for the witch. Holy shit. A lot of shit happened, actually. Let's get back into it. It's crazy. It's storming in the game and it's storming in real life, too. A news ticker popped up on a TV program we were watching. The disaster report told how municipalities all over were continually sending out rain, flood, and wave warnings. Of course, the raindrops beating harshly on the window were even more convincing. Woo! This rain's incredible. Still, when it's raining this hard, it also feels like it might stop at any moment. <laughs> you wish. They said the typhoon's moving slow, so it might be like, might be like this all day tomorrow. And even a little bad weather stops the boats from coming in. It looks like we won't be able to head out on Sunday after all. Just in case, I cleared all the outside business from my Monday schedule, and I'm glad I did. Which means, looks like we get to skip school Monday. Living on an island is starting to sound pretty good. Come to think of it, Jessica, you gotta take a boat to school every day, don't you? What do you do when the boats stop running? Do you stay home when it rains and show up late when the wind's blowing? Like King Kamehameha? If the boats don't come, I stay home. Still, it's not as good as it sounds. Usually, I'm more than to study by myself, but it's not that fun with somebody standing right behind you watching everything you do. During the rainy season, does the weather ever stay bad for a long time and make you miss a bunch of days in a row? That does happen sometimes. Still, I get a call from my homeroom teacher every single day who sourly guided me on how I should teach myself and what I had to turn in. She can't skip school as easily as you're imagining, Battler. She's got to follow the rules for everyone that traveled to school by boat and get a good amount of studying done. It'd actually be easier to just go to school. In my own room, I get distracted and can't concentrate. That's some real shit. After being made to do nothing but workbooks for several days straight, it's pretty hard to handle all that mental stress. When I get into college, I really just want to go some go to some dorm and quickly say goodbye to this inconvenient island. Ah, uh, okay. By the way, what do you do when the weather's good in the morning, but then gets so bad on your way home the boats are closed? Do you spend the night at school? That actually happens a lot. Because of that, they built some lodgings there for people who can't get back to the island they live on. That's where you spend the night. Sometimes when it gets really bad, you can't go home for a few days at a time. Someone commuting to school or work on the train packed in twice its capacity might carelessly think that commuting by boat would be pretty interesting and fun. But it sounds like it comes with troubles of its own. You hear thoughtless tourists saying stuff like that all the time. I've had enough of island life. I really want to just graduate high school and say goodbye to this island. But there are all dorms. But there are all dorm schools even for high school, right? Why'd you choose that Nijima school of all places? I wanted to go to one of those from the beginning. But mom's always going on about how I need to learn manners and discipline as a successor. So I ended up sticking close to home even for high school. Man, I hate this island. I just want to go live in a city. I don't care if it rains or even spears fall from the sky, bro. I'll, as long as I can move to a city where I can wear casual clothes and sandals and can get, get to a convenience store in less than five minutes. Hold on, I'm hungry as fuck. <laughs> Hold out just a little longer. Just a bit more and you'll graduate high school, right? I can't wait a little longer. <laughs> Jessica stretched down and reclined on the sofa. Maybe it was a bad time slot because there wasn't any interesting plant programs on. 
And we had nothing to do but languidly kill time until we were called for dinner. Called for dinner. Called a Wait, I, I, fuck, I can't say that. After that episode, Maria never returned to the cousin's room after all. Unrosa probably took her back to the mansion. Had to be pretty boring for Maria all by herself while the adults had a confusion conversation. We thought we might as well head over to the mansion to see her, but the weather really was awful. And since there wasn't much time until dinner, we stayed where we were. At that time, we heard a sound of a humble knock. Jessica answered. The preparations for dinner are complete. Please, come to the mansion. It was Kainan's voice. Did he go to all the trouble of coming from the mansion in his rain just to get us? Couldn't he have just called us on the telephone? I mean, I guess the servants at work don't always get the most, get to take the most efficient route. Just when I was getting hungry. Let's go. George turned off the television and stood up. My stomach's been growling for a while. I've always, won I've always been a huge fan of the man family's dinner. And didn't go to say it was a calf steak or something? Woo! I can't wait. Our dinners are always even more fabulous than usual when the family conference comes around. Even now I'm looking forward to it. Let's go, let's go. As we left the room, Kanon bowed silently and respectfully. Okay, let's go. Is the rain pretty nasty out there? Yes. Take care not to get your garments wet. After seeing the three of us out, Kanon peered into the empty room. Wasn't Maria with you? No, she's not. Wasn't she with Aunt Rosa? She's still outside? No way in hell she's still outside. Rosa was lying on a sofa in the empty parlor, having fallen asleep before she knew it. She was bearing a burden of, that the children couldn't even imagine. That's why she only needed to let her guard down a little before weariness immediately dragged her into a world of sleep. Realizing this, Genji brought a blanket over to her. When he tried to spread it over her, her eyes snapped open as though she'd been shocked with electricity. Thank you, Genji-san. When she realized that the thing that had touched her was just a blanket, and that Genji had been considerately, considerately giving it to her, she let out a sigh of relief. Did I wake you? My sincere apologies. No, it's okay. I hadn't planned on sleeping in the first place. Oh, what time is it now? When he was asked for the time, Genji checked the pocket watch that he took out of his chest pocket. It is slightly after 6 o'clock. Rosa gave her head a little shake when she realized that not much time had actually passed, even though it felt like she'd slept for ages. Even though she didn't feel rested at all, the drowsiness that had enveloped her must have been pretty deep. Thank you. I'll be fine without the blanket. I mustn't sleep at such a strange time. My sense of time has been completely thrown off. The rain. It's finally started pouring down in earnest, hasn't it? Rosa finally realized that the peaceful sound that had put her to sleep was actually the rain. The wind's blowing hard too. Hey, when the when the wind blow. I wonder if the typhoon's finally here. That's what they said on TV. The typhoon is moving slowly, so they think it will be like this all day tomorrow. Really? So our last chance to see that wonderful rose garden must have already passed. From the window, what she could see of the rose garden was completely blurred by the wind and the rain. Maria. That's right! What about Maria? I have not seen her. Did she not return to the guest house? Rosa knew her daughter's nature well, so a chill ran down her spine. Maria was stubbornly honest. And if she was ordered to find something that didn't exist, she would look forever and ever. Even in pouring rain. Damn! Hold on, I gotta check on my food. 
So she's still out there in that damn typhoon? This dumbass. Kids are fucking stupid. No. The cousins left before I did, so Maria was alone. Unless someone told her to stop, she stayed there even if it started raining spears. Without even opening an umbrella. Ah, uh, how could I lose control of my emotions and done such a thing? Even though she'd known about Maria's simple honesty better than anyone, she'd once again lost control of her emotions and done something terrible. Maria! Rosa pushed Genji away and ran down the hall. You ain't gotta push the dude like that. Yo, get your fucking daughter! The outside really looked like a typhoon. The rain was pouring down spectacularly. Maybe because of some aspect of the terrain. The winds weren't typhoon class, so an umbrella wouldn't be torn out of one's hands. Even though it certainly was a windy rain. There was no time to admire the roses being drenched. Anyway, I'm getting pretty worried about Maria. You don't think she's still rebelliously searching for that rose alone, do you? I wonder. Surely she wouldn't do it in this rain. Or at least I wish I could believe that. But Maria sometimes gets really stubborn and intensely straightforward. We hadn't worried much, thinking that Aunt Rosa had taken her back to the mansion. However, when Kanon had come from the mansion to call us and thought Maria was here, we got a little worried. I did not see her in the mansion, so I was sure she was here. After all, Rosa was taking a nap. You didn't see her on your way over here? My apologies. I opened my umbrella and ran as fast as I could, so I did not pay much attention. If he had cut through the rose garden and taken the shortest line between the mansion and the guest house, then he would have just barely missed the place where Maria had been looking for a rose. And it was raining this hard, too. It certainly would have been possible for Kainan to fail to notice her. Instead of arguing around here, it'd be faster to check it out directly. Aniki, why don't we race over there? Oh, do you think you can beat me now that you've been growing for over six years? Okay, let's settle this. Go! George and I flew out, of the, out into the rain. Jessica and Kanon followed us. If you're there, answer me! It's Aunt Rosa. Hey, Aunt Rosa! When George called back, Aunt Rosa jumped at him and grabbed onto him. Where's Maria? Is, is she with you? No, we didn't meet with Maria after that. Six years ago, Mar Maria was three... Shit. Six years ago, Maria was three years old, so she's nine now. She was a cute and pure kid who just accepted whatever anyone said. But six years has passed since then. She's nine now, and experiencing the ups and downs of life should have taught her something. But Maria, are you telling me you're still as innocent and pure as you used to be? Maria! As I circled the rose bed, something white unexpectedly turned to face me. It was a white umbrella. Maria was crouching down, holding a white umbrella, still searching for that rose. Her face, which had turned bright red from her crying her eyes out, was dirty with water and mud. It was a truly pitiful sight. Maria, are you still looking? Can't find it. Can't find my rose. Maria had probably been here since the rain started pouring down. Her shoulders were freezing. She looked tired to the bone, but fortunately, since she was holding an umbrella, she wasn't completely soaked. The umbrella probably came from the handbag Mari always carried around. Thank goodness. Thank Seriously, thank goodness. Battler. Thank goodness you found her. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Unrosa threw her umbrella aside and hugged Mario. 
It's not here. My rose isn't here. I'll look for it with you later. Okay? So just put it on hold for today. Okay? Put it on hold for today? It looked like Mario was still still wasn't able to accept it. But she no longer had enough energy left to resist. Jessica and Kanan caught up with us. I'll have a towel ready in the mansion immediately. Mario! Were you here this whole time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being such a bad mother. Hey. Unrosa, why don't we head back to the mansion for the time being? If we stay here, Mario will catch a cold. You're right. Mario, let's go. If we don't get you cleaned up, Grandfather will be mad. Hungry. It's already time to eat. You did a good job holding out, Mario. Once the weather gets better, we'll all go search together. We couldn't stay in the rain forever. We took Mario with us and we headed back to the mansion. Mario apparently wasn't as worn out as I thought. When she remembered we were having calf steak for dinner, she started chanting, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, Ooh, ah! and returned to her usual spirit itself. Aunt Rosa didn't chide Mario for saying, ooh, ooh. I see. So she had an umbrella on her. Mario sure is good at packing the right stuff. I didn't bring an umbrella. What? Then how did you get that white umbrella you're holding? I don't like this. I borrowed it! Nigga borrowed it for who? From who? Some caring person must have brought her an umbrella. Nigga who? Who? A normal kid would look for shelter once it started raining. But Mario was too stubborn to give up so easily. So maybe that caring person gave up on telling Mario to find shelter. Then decided to at least give her an umbrella. I see. I'll have to thank that person. Who was it? She's gonna say Beatrice. She's gonna say Beatrice. I fucking knew it! The name Mario cheerfully mentioned was that of the island's witch. Rosa took a deep breath and asked again, trying to do so in a way that wouldn't damage Mario's mood. Really? That's wonderful. So, who was it? Who brought you that umbrella? Maria immediately realized that her mother didn't believe her and started crying out unhappily again. So Rosa stopped pursuing the subject. It'd probably be faster to ask whoever lent Maria the umbrella during dinner rather than ask Maria herself. What is Beatrice got going on, bro? She over here. Father! Please, at least join us for dinner. It won't be a family conference otherwise. Along with the dull pounding on the door, the sound of Krause's entreaty could be heard. However, the voice seemed to be resigned to the fact that nothing it said would be heard. Kinzo, won't you at least come out for dinner? All your children have gathered here to see your face, haven't they? Silence, Nanjo. So the bishop won't work. <laughs> One move too short. Apparently, Kinzo was completely focused on the final battle of his long-lasting chess match with Nanjo. Kinzo's brow was wrinkled as he continued to glare at the game board through his spectacles. Krause's voice didn't reach his ear. <laughs> He's locked in. Kinzo, I'm hungry myself. Why don't we go down and eat? Go by yourself if that's what you want. Let me consider this next move for a little longer. We are going to finish it tonight. Otherwise, it's doubtful we'll finish it before the world ends. Nanjo rose from his seat, hoping this would prompt Kenzo to do the same. But Kenzo's eyes never left the chessboard. He knew well that Kenzo always displayed a blind concentration when it came to chess. But he'd never seen Kenzo concentrate as hard as this. It was almost as though Kenzo was telling the truth. 
and there will be a never never be a chance for them to continue their contest that they didn't finish tonight. It seemed that no matter how obstinately he called out to Kenzo, it wouldn't reach the latter's heart. Nanjo gave up and headed to the door that Cross was still banging on. The door to the study opened. Cross was taken aback, thinking that maybe Kenzo was actually coming out. However, Nanjo was the one who appeared, and Cross let out a sigh of relief. Nanjo -sensei. Dr. Nanjo. His father. I'm sorry I couldn't be of service. Right now, this room is Kenzo's whole world. Nanjo shook his head with a completely defeated expression. Kraus raised his fist once more and banged on the door, shouting, Father, can you hear me? We're heading down now, but please, join us anytime you like it. All of your children are waiting for you. His voice was very loud, and he was making a racket on the door. There was no way it wouldn't reach Kenzo's ears. Well, it certainly was reaching him, but he ignored it anyway. <laughs> However, unlike the time he'd been called down for lunch, he didn't fly into a rage. By now, Kenzo was calm at heart, almost as though he had taken on a philosophical view and turned himself over to fate. Neither dinner nor the faces of my children interest me in the slightest. I'm not gonna lie, I fucking love Kenzo. <laughs> I fucking love Kenzo, bro. Oh my goodness, this nigga is so fucking funny. He's such a dickhead. It's hilarious. <laughs> Neither dinner nor the faces of my children interest me in the slightest. I can't wait to become an old man with grandchildren and I just start saying that shit. I cannot wait, bro. I'm going to have my kids thinking I hate them. <laughs> that is not good. <laughs> I will only leave here if Beatrice is resurrected. Or if I am chosen as a sacrifice for the key. The demon's roulette has already started spinning. What meaning does dinner have at this point? As though the painfully loud banging on the door completely failed to enter his hearing, Kenzo silently thought about his next chess move, still in his philosophical state. Just as always, Kenzo's figure couldn't be seen anywhere in the dining hall. Kraus, wearing a bitter smile, returned with Nanjo. Father says he's still not feeling well. He truly regrets missing this once-a-year opportunity to sit together with his gathered family. Ava and Rudolph sniggered. <laughs> I'm sorry. Given Kenzo's personality, there's no way he was showing signs of regret. And none of his relatives showed any regret at his absence. Then, why don't we start dinner? Goda, begin. Certainly. Well then, if you would allow me. When Goda was told to start the family conference dinner, his biggest time to shine of the whole year, he nodded with a broad grin. A, bra a, bra a broad grin. Um, may I ask who lent Maria an umbrella? When Rosa timidly cut through the silence of the dining hall, everyone noticed. An umbrella? What's this about? Um, a short while back, Maria was in the Rose Garden when it started raining. And she apparently borrowed a white umbrella for someone. I wanted to thank them. It wasn't one of us. After you left, we moved to a different room and had a friendly chat the whole time. <laughs> That's right. Even after that, the siblings had a real friendly chat. The word friendly fell awkwardly from Hideyoshi's lips. So even those who weren't hadn't been present could tell the conversation hadn't been a pleasant one. At the very least, it couldn't have been Ava, Rudolph, Hideyoshi, or Kirie. We were together the whole time, even after Natsuhi and Rosa left. The whole time until the mill started. Nisan went up to the study with Genji to call father. And that time, the rest of us went straight to the dining hall. So it wasn't one of us. Couldn't have been a servant kind enough to lend an umbrella. So, was it you, Goda? I have been in the kitchen the whole time preparing. My sincere apologies. 
Gota looked slightly disappointed about missing this chance to show off. At the time, Shion and Kumasawa appeared, pushing a serving cart loaded with whore, the whore. Yeah. Then what about Kumasawa or Shonen? Damn. Yes? Has something gone wrong? Because Shonen had come in part way, she shrank back, mistakenly thinking that the others were searching for the one responsible for some error. It isn't like that. It started to rain when Maria was alone in the round rose garden. After that, someone lent her an umbrella. Aunt Rosa said she wanted to thank that person. Beatrice! Maria had her mouth in a thin line. Her, Maria, her mouth in a thin line, said the witch's name in a small voice. Aunt Rosa explained the situation one more time. And as she did, Kumasawa cackled. <laughs> it wasn't us. Shannon and I were preparing the rooms together, so we did not go outside. Yes. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be of assistance. Preparing rooms? What do you mean by that? Because of the rain, we thought it would be troublesome for all the guests to return to the guest house. So the servants were ordered to prepare the guest rooms inside the mansion. Really? How thoughtful. Yes, it certainly would be rude to chase us outside in this rain. Could you give it a rest? Yes, after receiving the order from Madam, Kumasawa and Kanon and I started preparing the rooms. Then it became time for dinner, so Genji ordered Kanon to go to the guest house and summon the children. Yes. So, did Kanon find Mario on the way to the guest house and hand her the umbrella? Oh, she's getting pissed. Wrong! Bitch! The person who had actually received the umbrella denied it. Rosa was troubled. All she wanted to do was give a word of thanks to the person who had lent an umbrella, but she couldn't find them. And she thought asking like this would everyone gather for dinner would work immediately. <sighs> then, was it you, Natsuhi? I'm sorry. After everyone's friendly chat, my headache was so bad that I've been resting in my room. Therefore, I did not go outside. Then who was it? George and the kids? That can't be right. No, it wasn't us. We were watching television in the guest house the whole time. Actually, we had thought Maria had just went back to the mansion with you. Then Kanon came and he asked whether Maria was with us. That's when we first realized she wasn't in the mansion. I mean, if it were me, I'd grabbed her hand and pulled her under a roof before giving her an umbrella. Rosa was completely baffled. One, one by one, the relatives and the servants denied that they had done it. Even though it wasn't really something anyone would need to hide. So by process of elimination, the number of remaining candidates wasn't large. Let me check on my food. Of course it wasn't me. Right after it began raining, I visited Kenzo's room, and I was playing chess with him until now. Which means that it also wasn't grandfather. Wait a sec. Isn't it starting to get a bit weird? Who's left? Then, who was it? Genji? Huh? Uh, wait a sec. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm searching for some culprit or anything. All I want to do is, as a mother, thank the person who gave Maria an umbrella in the middle of the rain. Giving an umbrella to a girl loitering in the rain was something to be praised, not hidden. Despite that, no one raised their hand. Why not? Everyone started whispering about how strange this was getting. Calm down, Rosa. Why don't we just ask the person who was lent the umbrella? That's what everyone had been thinking since the beginning. They were all scratching their heads at why she didn't just ask Maria, who had been given the umbrella. However, Rosa bit her blow her lip. After all, she already knew how Maria would answer if asked. Of course! Rudolph, he's got it, right? Maria, tell your uncle! Who lent you the umbrella? 
The dinner hall was wrapped in silence for an instant, but it was soon interrupted by a burst of laughter. I see. So Beatrice, the witch of the forest, felt pity and lent her an umbrella. What a lovely story. Rosa, there you have it. Rosa couldn't believe it. Even though she just wanted to say thanks for the umbrella, why did everything have to be so clouded in smoke? Just like Uncle Krause said. Beatrice, let me borrow it. Isn't that wonderful? We should all be jealous of such purity. What do you think, everyone? Cross was laughing with a face that was clearly mocking, but Mario was overjoyed, apparently convinced that her claim was being believed. Mocking a child is crazy, bro! How did that work? Does that mean a witch really appeared and lent her an umbrella? Jessica asked me in a small voice I went to carry over to Maria, who was sitting across from me. Has Maria ever been the type to make jokes? If we'd ever heard that, if we'd, if we'd heard that kind of story pop out of my old bastard's mouth, we would have just taken it as another joke. However, it was hard to explain it away like that when Maria said it. This was getting pretty unnerving. No way. She's always been frank and serious. She's a sort who'd believe any joke, even if even the even ones normal people could tell were lies. I've never even heard her cracking a joke. Aunt Rosa probably knew that better than anyone. It appeared that because of this weird situation, she had no idea what was going on anymore. So, if Maria said he, she borrowed an umbrella from Beatrice, that must mean it was really Beatrice. We're talking about Maria here. So I can't think of it as some kind of metaphor or joke. It, it might be best to take what she says at face value. Then what's going on? Are you saying Genji is someone put on a fancy dress from the portrait and gave Maria the umbrella? I'm not sure about that. Actually, that's what I want to know. Jessica shrugged jokingly, but her expression didn't completely match her attitude. Once the whore, Devore, was set out and Gota showed off his vast store of knowledge, the meal began. A couple casual chats broke out here and there, but they seemed somehow distant. And the meal ended up being so quiet that you couldn't ignore the sound of the rain sneaking into the dining hall. Kumasawa and Shanan, pushing a serving cart, ran into Genji and Kano on their way into the kitchen. Oh, Genji, did you lend Mario an umbrella? An umbrella? What are you talking about? Well, I heard that when it started raining, Mario was alone in the Rose Garden. It seems she brought an umbrella for someone there, but we don't know who it was. It wasn't me. After all, I actually thought Mario was in the guest house. When Battle had first found her, she was already holding a white umbrella. My apologies, but it was not me either. Then could it actually be the master? Both in the dining hall and right here, everyone has stated that they hadn't done it. That only left Kenzo, but... Maybe he went walking down the corridor for some reason, when he just happened to see Mari in the Rose Garden without even an umbrella. The master is not particularly fond of Maria. I agree. I can't imagine that for Maria's sake, he'd go to all the trouble of descending the stairs with an umbrella. Oh my, how troublesome. Does that mean the one who lent Maria an umbrella was really Beatrice? <laughs> Kumasawa laughed, just like the relatives in the dining hall who had laughed it off. She couldn't think of any other way to break through this smoke veiling the current situation. Just then, the crisp sound of hands clapping twice rang through the hallway. They all turned around at once to see Goda coming out of the dining hall. 
Okay, everyone. When serving a dinner, proper timing is while setting the table is essential. Please immediately set out. Set, um, please, um, fuck! Please immediately see to setting out the soup. Genji, the women are in the middle of an important job, so please don't get in their way. Who do you think you are talking to him like that? Genji will beat the fuck out your nasty ass. Kanon glared at Goda for being rude to Genji, a person Kanon respected. Genji, realizing this, patted Kanon on the shoulder as a warning. Kanon reluctantly turned away and returned his expression to normal. Obey Genji's instructions. Hurry and prepare the table. Come now, there's no time. Don't dawdle. Hurry. Go to grab the serving cart from Shannon and steadily push it toward the kitchen. Then, please allow us to return to the kitchen. After all, Goda's temper is very short. Please excuse me as well. Somebody need to beat Goda's ass, bro. I swear, somebody need to beat his ass. I fucking hate that nigga. Kumasawa and Shannon left. Only Genji and Kanon remained. Through the window, the darkness of the rainy night could be seen, along with the occasional thunderbolt. Genji, did Beatrice really return? I don't know. Shall I inform the master? That is not necessary. If she truly has returned, she will eventually be appear before the master of her own accord. Furthermore, she is a fickle person. It would be pointless to report to the master only to find out that she does not appear. I wonder if this means the master's ceremony has already begun. Probably. However, that has nothing to do with furniture like us. We must continue to return the favor we receive from the master until our final moments. Yes. That is furniture's duty. The thunder crashed once more, except for those instants, for those in instants when lightning lit up the sky, nothing could be seen out of the window but the darkness of night. Just as humans rule when the sun is up, those that are not human rule when the sun is down. Hard as fuck. The darkness of night that now surrounded Rock and Jima was ruled by another master, not the Oshiro Mia family. Did this master take pity on Mario when she was alone and being pummeled by the rain in the Rose Garden, lending her an umbrella? Kanan looked at the Rose Garden's light, dimly visible beyond the window. The dim lights weren't enough to illuminate the surrounding area. Looking at those lights felt like making eye contact with the witch. And Kanan forced his gaze away. If he didn't, it felt like his eyes would be absorbed by that light. Can the weather change how people act? You often hear stories about how things like atmospheric pressure can influence people's moods and physical health. For some time now, everyone had been struggling to clear the gloomy atmosphere, but any conversation was quickly cut off, and in the end, the dining hall was simply filled by the sound of rain. Dessert was some kind of chocolate cake accompanied by pear sherbet. Goda enthusiastically explained the recipe as soon as his final dish was presented, but I quickly forgot the details. I'm not listening to that bitch ass. The guest of honor, grandfather, was absent. The weather was horrible, and the identity of the one who lent Mario an umbrella remained a mystery. When the dinner ended, no one felt even a one bit refreshed. It was too late now. But I realized painfully that taste wasn't the only important part of a meal. The whole atmosphere was also critical. Goda, the supposed conductor of this musical piece called Dinner, did his best to enliven the place, dropping little jokes left and right, but apparently not one of them succeeded. What the freak was that? Hold on, bro. Is Beatrice in my crib messing, touching stuff? I'm over here thinking Beatrice done got in my crib. It was just my grandma. What was, what was, after taking orders for after dinner coffee, tea, and orange juice, he left for the kitchen. As soon as he disappeared, Uncle Krauss spoke. Yeah, yeah. 
My, my. What a waste that Danner go to work so hard to create. What a waste that the Danner go to work so hard to create has, has met with such a gloomy atmosphere. Yes, absolutely. It just feels like nothing would taste good today. I'd like to know why you feel that way. Later on, I'll do all I can as your older brother to help cheer you up. Aunt Ava grimaced slightly. I'd already heard she wasn't on good terms with Uncle Krause, but it was pretty clear now. When I looked around, I noticed that my father and Aunt Rosa was also grimacing. Apparently, there was something besides the weather troubling all of them. Both Aunt Ava and my dad aren't looking too happy. Really? I don't think so. I asked Aunt Nasuhi who was sitting on my right, but she seemed to be in a bad mood as well. For good reason. She snapped back as if to say she was absolutely not interested. Well, our adult conversation got a little complicated. It isn't something kids like you need to worry about battling. Isn't that right, Nasuhi? Kirie? Uncle Hideyoshi laughed as he spoke, but without his usual brightness, so I could vaguely imagine just how complicated their adult conversation had become. On top of that, even Aunt Natsuhi and Kirie, the people he had directed his comment to, ignored him as though they, they hadn't heard anything. I didn't know what kind of conversation they'd been having while us kids were away, but it reminded me of how Dad said he had stomach cramps when he arrived at the mansion. The family conference might have been a playful reunion for us kids, but it was definitely different for the adults. After Uncle Hideyoshi's comment was ignored by the other adults and an awkward silence fell over the room, Kirie spoke up. We were talking about how the kids' careers would turn out, such as what lies in your future battling. Will you just drift on to college? Wouldn't that be a little disheartening as a starting line for their long race of life? Hey, 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 wait a sec. Kirie. If you start talking about something like that in the middle of a meal, it won't digest well, and we'll all end up getting constipated. <laughs> Is that true? That's right, that's right. We were talking about Battler and Jessica's careers. You gotta think seriously about the future. Hideyoshi heartily agreed as if they had been talking about that, but that was probably wrong. Kiri had obviously been trying to change the subject. However, if Kiria had determined that that was the best course of action for now, then she was probably right. Taking this into account, I cast aside my suspicions as to the cause behind Aunt Ava and Dad's bad moods. At long last, a serving cart returned filled with coffee and tea. Kumasawa and Shana served it to everyone. Goda then explained that this concluded tonight's meal. If only the mood had been a bit more cheery, it might have been the best dinner of my life. It was a shame this best of dinners couldn't have been under the best conditions. George, is dinner over now? Over? 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 Yes. With this, dinner is finished. Don't be rude. Stay in your seat and calmly drink up. Maria looked like she was really excited by the occasionally crashing thunder. Maybe she wanted to quickly finish eating and run over to the window. She had been fidgeting for a while, waiting for the meal to end. Some people are afraid of thunder while others find it interesting. Maria was apparently of the latter sort. Therefore, when she heard that from George the dinner was over, a huge smile broke across her face. She then rose from her seat, took out her handbag, which she set under her seat, never having left it even while she was eating and began fishing around inside of it. No one seemed particularly concerned by this behavior. Nondai. What's that? Where did you get it? George was the first to notice it. As he spoke, Battler noticed too. Oh, hell no. Nah. Uh-uh. That is ominous. They saw that Maria was now holding a beautiful Western-style envelope. On the front of the envelope, the Ushirimiya family crest... The one-winged eagle was done on a, was done in on a gold leaf. Furthermore, the fact that it was sealed with dark red wax made it clear that this wasn't something Maria could have brought brought as a prank. Maria, what is that? 
It seemed that Natsuhi had also noticed the strangeness of the envelope Mario was holding. Her voice sounded too serious for someone admonishing a small child. So the relatives around us finally noticed too. What happened, Natsuhi? What is that? Maria, where did you pick that up? That envelope has... Kinzo's... When Nanjo muttered that, even us kids could understand why everyone seemed to be frozen solid. When the envelope that Maria held was one of the Ushira Mia heads, custom-made envelopes for private use. In other words, it could only mean one thing. This envelope contained a message from Kenzo. What is an envelope like that doing here? Now, that's an interesting thing to come jumping out at us. J just let me have a peek. No way! I'll read it! I was told to read it to everyone. Uncle Hideyoshi tried to snatch the envelope out of Maria's hands, but she protected it as though hugging and didn't let go. Hideyoshi, you can't use force against a child. Maria, where did you get this envelope? I got it from Beatrice when she gave me the umbrella. She told me to read it to everyone after the meal was over. I'm the witch's... I'm the... Me... Me... Messenger! Messenger? <laughs> the almighty witch of the island sure likes to mess around. Battler tried to joke about it, but no one laughed. Dang. I... I, I, I wonder what's written inside of it, Maria. Gonna read it! Maria casually opened the envelope. It was sealed only with wax, so she just had to remove the sealing wax to open it. That sealing wax fell onto the desk. Hideyoshi hastily picked it up and stared fixedly at it. He then set it at the center of the table where Natsuhi, Kirie, and Nanjo stared at it. Imprinted on the sealing wax was the one-winged angel, which was the Ushiramiya family crest and was also Kenzo's personal crest. This... this is the family head's personal crest. I know it from the letters I have received from Kenzo before. Without a doubt, this is his wax seal. But aren't there several things in his mansion bearing that crest? For example, if there was some kind of stamp for wax seals, couldn't someone other than Kenzo have used it? No. Kenzo would always use the ring on his finger. It's proof of the Ushira Mia family headship when he sealed the wax. This shape and complex assign is definitely Kenzo's seal. That is not necessarily so. Anyone in the family must have received a letter from father at least once. We can't eliminate the possibility that someone used that wax as a model to create a fake seal and pass himself off as father. I agree with Aniki. No matter how much the seal resembles Dad's, we can't prove that it's the real thing. So it doesn't prove that this envelope came from him. I absolutely agree. I cannot approve of arbitrarily the sign of this letter came from Father, based solely on the wax seal. Dr. Nanjo, couldn't you use a bit more discretion with your vague words? Weather's getting bad. I apologize. It was not my place to speak. One after another, all the siblings from Kraus on downwards rejected Nanjo's statement, saying that the envelope Maria held wasn't necessarily from Ken Ken Kenzo. They were afraid. They feared from the bottom of their hearts that Kenzo's intentions were written in there, and that it and that it might be some announcement regarding the inheritance that would be decidedly unfavorable to them. Maria, the person who gave you that envelope was the same person who gave you the, the lens of the umbrella, right? I don't know what U means. Is it true? Yes. So in other words, 
The witch, Beatrice, gave Maria that envelope along with the umbrella. Maria nodded forcefully. I agree with my husband. It's a dubious letter handed over by some suspicious person. It isn't even worth reading. There's nothing wrong with just reading it, right? Battler said it to Jessica in a small voice trying to act tough. But not till he heard him clearly and glared at him with threatening eyes. And, and then... Uh... Beatrice told you to read it after the meal was over, right, Maria? It's okay, everyone. This envelope didn't come from grandfather, but from Beatrice. Regardless of who actually wrote it, why, why can't we just hear what's inside before we decide? That's, that's right. Even if father didn't necessarily write it, I'd still like to know what was inside. Maria, I'm sorry I tried to take it from you by force earlier. I apologize, so will you read it aloud in front of everyone? Maria. Maria, read it. As all the relatives stared fiercely at Maria, she spread the letter open with a rustle. Do you think it really came from dad? Impossible. Whenever father has announced something to us in the past, he would always send Genji if he didn't do it directly, correct? I cannot believe that it would use such a joke-like approach. That's right! Maria, a messenger? That definitely doesn't suit father's taste. Rosa, could it be this? Could, it, could this be Maria trying to surprise us by putting on some kind of show? Maria isn't really the kid who'd be capable of something so thoughtful. Gonna read it. The words came out of Maria's mouth, but for some reason, her voice sounded different than usual. Everyone suddenly went silent. Uh-uh! She sound evil! Welcome to Rakenjima, members of the Ushiramiya family. I am Beatrice, the alchemist for this family employed by Kenzo himself. Ha! <laughs> That's crazy! Quiet! I have served them for many years in accordance with our contract, but on this day, Kenzo has announced the final suspension of that contract. Therefore, I ask that you acknowledge my resignation from the position of family alchemist from this day forward. How foolish, what nonsense! I can't stand to listen to it! And now, there is one part of the contract that must be explained to all present. I, Beatrice, lent Kenzo a vast quantity of gold under certain terms. One of these terms spe specifies that all the gold is to be returned to me upon the termination of the contract. Furthermore, I am to receive everything of the Ushiramiya family as interest. Ridiculous! It's, it's been ridiculous from the very beginning. So it's basically one of those things, right? Doesn't it sound like one of those contracts with the devil? The contract has expired, so they come to collect the interest? Is she trying to grab some retirement money from her old age or something? What a cheeky witch. Battler, now isn't the time to joke around. Battler made a face as if to ask, if I can't make fun of this, what can I make fun of? Some of the adults' faces were pale while others look dazed. After hearing this, you may feel as though Kenzo has been savagely ruthless. However, Kenzo did append a special clause of the contract that you would have your chance to preserve your wealth and honor. If, and only if, that special clause is fulfilled, I will lose my rights to the gold and the interest for all eternity. A special clause. What is it? Special clause. Beatrice retains the right to collect the gold and accumulated interest upon the termination of the contract. However, if someone is able to discover this hidden gold, uh, hidden the, the, uh, discover the hidden gold of this contract, Beatrice must abandon these rights for all time. The collection of the interest will proceed shortly. But if any one of you fulfills the terms of this special clause, 
I shall return everything, including the portion that has already been collected. Furthermore, as the first step in this collection of Kenzo's death, I have taken possession of the Ashura Mia family's head's ring, which signifies the passage of the Ashura Mia family's headship from one individual to another. I ask that you confirm this for yourself by examining the imprint on the wax seal. Are they trying to claim that that's the meaning behind this seal? That father will relinquish his wing is unthinkable. Kraus stared at the ceiling wax as if trying to burn a hole through it. Ava and Rudolph were doing the same over his shoulder. Come to think of it, when we were playing chess, I did have a strange feeling that something was missing from Kenzo's finger. Dr. Nanjo! Don't say something so careless just because of a vague memory! We can't prove its authenticity here. Only by asking Father directly can we determine whether he really handed over his ring and whether this letter tells the truth. That's right. It's just as Kyrie says. Do you really think Kenzo will tell you? After all, that person's thought sometimes surpasses the bounds of common sense. No matter what happens, it's still nonsense. In the first place, the illusion of gold itself is one of Father's tricks. I've already heard enough talk about that gold from the rest of you. But this is the witch speaking, right? About how the inheritance and all the ashes will be handed over to the one who finds the gold, right? So maybe Beatrice is, is father's le legal advisor or, or in charge of his funds? We can't possibly trust some strange person who entrusts a suspicious paper to a child. Aniki, we need you to be frank with us. Is it possible death ashes are being managed by someone you don't know? No, that's impossible! As a, as a family's head representative, I control all the father's assets. It should be impossible for anyone to do as they please with them without me knowing it. So this must mean there are some assets you don't control, right? How foolish! Such assets cannot possibly exist. Oh, but there is such a thing. And that's sort of father that you don't control. There is no such thing that could exist. No, it does. It's father's. No. Beatrice is hidden gold. Let's keep it simple. In short, dad has some trusted confidante. Confidante that Aniki doesn't even know about. Furthermore, this person has always been in charge of watching and managing the gold. Or it could be some eccentric rich person who offered him a loan with rules like a devil's contract. Could it be that this confidante called Beatrice is trying to test which of Kenzo's children is most worthy to be financed by her goal? Kyrie's question was one that all the siblings wanted answered. Upon reflection, they realized that Kenzo's strange epitaph had hung in the hall beneath the witch's portrait for quite some time. And while it had been, while it had long been whispered that whoever solved the puzzle would receive everything, no one had clearly stated it. It was just something that everyone had hoped might be true. And right here, right now, the thing they hoped for had been clearly stated in Beatrice's letter. They clearly specified that everything in the Yoshu and Mia family would be given to the one who found the gold. Kenzo has already made a already publicly displayed the location of the hidden gold within the epitaph under my portrait. The rules apply equally to all who can read the epitaph. If you discover the gold, I shall return everything to you. Tonight, I ask that you enjoy your battle of wits with Kenzo to the fullest. I sincerely pray that this night will be both intellectual and elegant. Beatrice the Golden. Wowza. Father, I know you can hear me. Please respond. The door to Kenzo's study was being violently, harshly beaten against over and over, like a percussion instrument. The yells coming from the other side belonged to Kraus, Rudolph, and sometimes Ava. It was the siblings who were trying to intrude upon Kenzo's study to question him about the truth behind the mysterious letter. Kenzo was eating. An elegant tablecloth was set over the desk and the fabulous dinner that had been that had adorned the table down in the dining hall was reproduced here. Kenzo continued his meal in silence, 
Shanan taking away an empty plate looked uncomfortably between the door being pounded on in Kenzo's face. I love how he just does not care. Everyone is calling for you. But what should I do? Leave them. God and my mills both hold silence as a virtue. Should I silence them? There's no need. It has not even reached my ears. Kenzo enjoyed his food, apparently indifferent. Genji quietly lowered his head and took a single step back. As he did, Kanan who stood in reserve like a shadow behind and to the side of Genji opened his mouth. Maria apparently received a letter from Beatrice, so I imagine it went to test its authenticity. Has she, fought, has she started already then? Come Beatrice! I have no shortage of coins to be wagered. Shall we enjoy this night to the fullest? I don't think I'll lose. Your smile will be mine for all eternity. If I could see it one more time, I wouldn't regret losing my wealth, my honor, or even my life. Well then, the roulette has begun to spun. Which pocket will the ball fall into? Noir, Rogue, or House takes it all. Come, you may begin, Beatrice. I'll show you the power of miracles once more. He think he redacted Higurashi spoilers. But hey, if you know Higurashi, you know what I'm talking. You know who I'm talking about. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment. I'll read them all. Type into the next one, dog. It is turning up for real. I gotta say, my favorite character so far has gotta be Kenzo. I'm, we don't see him a lot, but he's he like oh my goodness. Every time I see him, I just love him, bro. But besides that, it's still probably besides Kenzo, it's still probably um Kitty A and Rouse. Those are yeah, those are still probably my was it Rouse? What was his name? Rudolph, Rudolph. So stupid. But man, this game is turning up. That little letter, everybody panicking, that was hard. I can't wait to see how this goes, bruh. Oh my goodness. Peace out. I love y'all. Tap into the next one.